talk and discuss and, and go home and try to think of some new way to do things. And the new way to do things that people have um, come up with actually a long time ago. This goes back to Warshall in 1972, I believe, was the first attempt at this. It was this idea of a multi-layered method. So if we would do, if we would realize that the quantum, that an enzyme, for example, the quantum mechanical effects that I've talked about, what one thing it would, with respect to the electrons, I mean, one of them is bond breaking or bond rearrangement. That's typically happening in a very localized place. You actually know where it is, right? So an enzyme is doing some reaction. You typically, if you have a decent experimental friend or you've read enough literature, you know what the reaction is, and you even know more or less where it's happening. And so, if you want to understand more details about the mechanism, why should you have to do the whole thing quantum mechanically? And this is actually what someone was trying to suggest before. Now, um, there's certainly some truth to that, that, the, that it would be enough, that at, least at, at least at the zeroth order approximation, it would be reasonable if I could do this, and then I would, but then I would need to have some environment, right? And I would need to somehow treat the environment, and I've given you some tricks that would allow you to actually treat the environment for much bigger systems than you could if you didn't have these tricks, but but you can't, uh, you know, there's no way that with what I've told you so far, you're going to model an entire protein and get the, the whole, you know, basically have the whole, and the solvent shell around this thing, right? There's, there's no way. Right? There's no way that you're going to have 50,000 atoms or, or 10,000 atoms even. So the idea was to then put a molecular mechanics force field around some quantum mechanics, and then even people thought about, well, maybe we'll put something else on the outside, and who knows what that is, but... Um, maybe a continuum model or something along those lines, which we'll talk about later. This picture actually comes from a, a, a pretty nice review article in Council Chemical Research that you can read. But the um, but okay, so the partitioning, the basic idea then is that I'm going to write the energy as some part which comes from the quantum mechanical subsystem, that little white part before, plus the molecular mechanical part, uh, plus some coupling term. And the only thing that's hard is the quantum mechanical molecular mechanical part. In fact. I mean, I'll, I'll, I may say something about this later, but it's not even clear that I know what to write here at all, right? I'm going to pretend that I do for a while, but it's not clear that I, that if you press me, I'm going to actually know what to do. The, um, but anyway, so that's, that's the hard part. This part's easy, this part's easy. This part I know is basically just the, uh, I use a, um, well, basically I just use a time independent Schrodinger equation. And I know I have some variational expression, for example, for if I know the electronic wave function for the quantum mechanical part, and I know the electronic Hamiltonian, I know the energy. And this you obviously know because you're already doing classical MD. So there are two articles that you might want to read. The original Warshall and Levitt, which is really, um, although it's by modern standards quite crude, it's quite amazing given that it was in 1975 or whatever. And a later article by Field, Dash, and Karplus, which sort of resurrected all of this. So the, um, the question then is what should be done? The first question that you should ask, though, before we start worrying too much about the coupling, we should ask what we should do in the quantum mechanical region. Right, so because I've actually given you already a whole sort of plethora of techniques, and so what should you do? And you could either do something sort of conventional ab initio wave function based method, you could do a density functional theory, you could do a semi empirical. And the answer to this usually is simply dictated by, compu by you know, just by computational requirements. That, um, and it usually ends up that people end up using semi empirical methods. Now, there are advantages to that. Because semi-empirical methods tend to, by construction, tend to be very localized. Right? That is, the you, you don't you're not allowed to expand the basis set in the semi-empirical method. I mean, basically the programs won't let you. Right? So somebody somewhere decreed that if you're going to do a semi-empirical method, the basis set's fixed and tough on you. Right? And this basically because it's parameterized for that. But the um, but that means that you can't actually include the basis functions that would allow electrons to leak out across the boundary. Which, as you'll start, if you think about this for very long, you'll start to realize, well, that would be a real big problem, wouldn't it? If somehow at this boundary, now I start putting in more and more diffuse basis functions, and my electrons start figuring out, hey, you know what? There's a molecular mechanical atom over there with a charge of 0.5 g. You know, that sounds pretty good, right? <laughs> They'd go over there, right? And so this would not be a good thing. So, the um, so actually the so the fact that they've used semi-empirical methods in some ways, that's actually. In some ways, that protects you from some of the problems that you could get into because of this artificial localization that's imposed on the wave function. So I'm not going to say that that's bad. I think that it's pretty clear that eventually, you know, in the progression here, you do want to do something better. And more and more, people are going to um, ab initio and DFT types of techniques and running into exactly the problems I'm alluding to. But the um, 
But okay, so why is it that the answer is dictated by cost, or why do I say that? And the reason is because, the, because of what I was alluding to in response to one of the questions, that the real problem here is the QMM interaction term itself. And if, that, if the boundary is close to what you're interested in, then you also know you're in trouble. So you need to be able, it's not just that you need to be able to do the subsystem of interest in, with some level of theory. It's that you actually need to be able to do that plus a buffer region that's large enough that you can actually even extend it a little bit and see that your result doesn't change. Right? And, the, and you know if that boundary is right on the system that you want, or right at the edge, that you know, I mean, it's basically a no-brainer that when you change it by one atom or two atoms or something along those lines that it's going to change the answer because it's, you know that you don't have good enough control of the QMMM boundary. Right? I mean, this is just a fact at this point. But, the, um, but also, if you're, you wouldn't even, you would, you would computation not even be able to move it at all because you're already at the edge of what you can do. Right? So, so this actually pushes people to lower level methods so that they can push the boundary out farther. The, um, okay, so what are the pitfalls? The, there's one thing that, you know, I'll write this, this sort of schematic potential energy surface uh, force field representation down again. And one of the things I want to point out is that there are many force fields, right? So there's charm, amber, gromos, whatever. At charm point two, charm point four, charm 19. Which one should you actually use with the quantum mechanical molecular mechanical method? Does it matter? And that, I mean, I, I'm, just, I, I'm just asking the question. Nobody knows the answer, really. Mm -hmm. right, so the answer to that is actually sort of somebody should find out the answer, but nobody really knows. Nobody's done a systematic test. And, they, and that's mostly because these methods are not really routinely available yet. I mean, they're still pretty hard. They are available, as I mentioned, in some commercial codes like Jaguar and QSight, which will do this. But, they, but there are very few. There's only a couple. And, they, um, and so, so people have tended to actually try to do things which were going to solve problems that they were really interested in rather than do benchmarking, which I guess some people, well, many people think is boring for reasons that I think that everybody can understand. But it's actually necessary. So this is really an indictment. I mean, this should, this should be done, which I guess maybe I'm just indicting myself. But anyway, the, um, there's another issue, and that is that there's no direct map from the wave function into parameters. And what I'm really trying to say is that in the same way that there is no direct expression that you can write down which will take you from a quantum chemistry calculation to a force field, Right? Instead, you know, we, we sort of, I sort of alluded to this, that you'd have to calculate second derivatives and you have to fit things and the, um, you have to calculate a bunch of geometries and then try to fit one expression back to the other in some way and you could maybe approximate these things. But there isn't a single calculation that you do that would just magically give you all the parameters. Right? And that's, that tells you something. It tells you that when you actually combine these things together, if you don't know how to take a single calculation and turn it into a quantum calculation, and turn it into a force field calculation, then that means that you don't understand how to couple a quantum mechanical calculation with a force field calculation. Right? If you understood that, you would be able to turn one to the other, right? And you would know exactly what terms you're missing when you go from one to the other and you don't. So that actually, so the fact that that um, that parameterizing a force field is not a simple matter of pushing a button and then everybody gets the same answer in some quantum chemistry graph. I'm not saying that this is not robust and you can't do it. I'm just saying that actually that it's a more complicated issue than just a keyword in every quantum chemistry program that you say, give me a force field, and then it pops out a force field. And that's because there are theoretical issues involved. And so, which some of which we'll talk about. But okay, so, so that tells you you should expect some problems. Now there's really three ways, there are three sorts of levels of QMMM, and we get into more and more trouble when we go, when we descend well, sort of into the ninth circle of hell, or something along those lines. But the, but, but the first level is mechanical embedding, right? And this basically is the crudest thing you can imagine in QMMM, which is the only thing that's going to be in the QMMM Hamiltonian interaction term is the van der Waals. And basically, not, I mean, you shouldn't even say van der Waals because that implies that, that I'm really doing dispersion somehow there. What I'm really doing is just repulsion, right? So all that I really want is steric effects. Now, from a biological perspective, this is almost worthless. But you can actually do this really well <laughs> because steric effects you understand pretty well. It's just e to the minus alpha r. Most people can figure that out. And so, the, so if you include only the van der Waals in the QMMM part, then you basically just you have this. And all that you need are the van der Waals parameters, the epsilon, 
And sigma is basically, or if you want, just the alpha, the exponential decay. And you can easily fit those. You don't even need to fit those. You can just take, they're basically well known to be quite transferable. And you can just pull them out of the charm parameter file, and it'll work pretty well. And so the, um, so you can, you, the, so this is useful only if you're trying to impose steric constraints. But what I want to point out is that even though in a biological context you would rarely have a system where steric constraints were the only thing involved, if you're doing QMM types of things, you can actually use that to your advantage to isolate. St what, what is the steric contribution? Right, so what is the contribution really from the protein sort of holding on to or pushing or whatever like mechanically against some reactant? And that contribution, the same way that you would isolate a hydrogen bonding term because NAMD will print out E hydrogen bond, right? And so you can figure out that you actually have this isolated in components. You can actually, in a QMMM calculus, you can use these, this hierarchy to your advantage to actually decompose into the pieces. Right? So you can turn everything off except the mechanical terms and then actually see what's due to sterics and what's due to electrostatics and what's due to covalent waves, which is going to be the next thing. So electrostatic embedding. Obviously, this basically is going to include the electrostatic interaction at the QMM Hamiltonian. The thing that you should understand is that there are many ways to do this. And there's only one right way to do it, but there are many ways to do it. And the other many ways are often used. And again, it's actually not known. I mean, I can't tell you that it's, I can't tell you that it's bad or that it's not bad. I mean, actually, no one knows again. But you need to be aware of what the options are, because this is one of the things you have to know. If you're going to, if you run a QMM simulation, you have to know what does this code do for the electrostatics. And in particular, the question is this. This is what you should do. That this is the correct thing to do. The correct thing is basically to have the QMM part be the mechanical part that we wrote before, which is just this van der Waals pairwise sum, plus the integral now, the sum over molecular mechanical atoms of the molecular mechanical charge times the integral of the quantum mechanical density, right? And so basically what this means is that you have to calculate these integrals, right? And that means that takes time, calculating all those integrals. And especially if you have lots and lots of molecular mechanical atoms, it takes a lot of time, right? Basically it's going to go as it's going to, the effort is going to go with the size of the molecular mechanical part. So far, everything actually, all of the effort in the quantum mechanics and the mechanical embedding, the quantum mechanical effort just goes with the size of the quantum mechanical system. And there's no part that depends on the molecular mechanical part that's not trivial because the pairs are, the pairwise interactions are very easy to evaluate. But this actually isn't necessarily so easy to evaluate. And so oftentimes what people will do, it's also harder to code. And so oftentimes what people will do is instead to um, write this expression where I have the sum over, well, that should be QI, QJ divided by R, but divided by Rij. But the, where I'll take the uh, charge on the molecular mechanical atom times some charge, which is a function of the quantum mechanical density. And the question is, how do you get that charge? Right? Does that charge even actually sum up to zero? I mean, hopefully it does. I'm sure that would in most codes. But does it have the right dipole moment? Does it have the right, pole, the right um, quadrupole moment? So forth and so on. And that's not so clear. And actually, and, what, and does it have the right value, which actually, to which there is no right answer? That question has no answer. You'll find out in a few minutes. <coughs> but, but okay, well, actually, you'll find out right now. Because now we really have to talk about atomic charges. This goes back, someone asked in terms of force fields, what do I do for, you know, what, how would I get parameters out? And I sort of gave some hints in that direction. But I didn't want to say anything about charges. And the reason I didn't want to say anything about charges is that it's actually very, it's not so clear what you should do with charges. And what you need to understand is that atoms are, well, atoms are perfectly well defined if they're isolated, right? But atoms in molecules are your construction or mine or people's. They're not molecules. Don't don't care that they're atoms, right? They and what that really that what does that mean? I mean, that sounds like a silly thing to say, but actually, what it means is that there's no physical observable that you can evaluate which will tell you the atom stops here and it stops here, right? And so that means that you can't that the definition of an atomic charge is inherently ambiguous. And it can't actually, it has to be ambiguous. So, so now let's actually say, well, you know, maybe there is something useful that can come out. Maybe we actually shouldn't have been asking about that in the first place. And I think that'll be, that'll be my, my more or less, that'll more or less be my answer. But okay, so, the, so what do people do? The first thing are our population analysis schemes. And this really, by this, I, you know, I don't want to write down the equations for all this stuff, but but basically, it's uh, what's called Mulliken and Levine types of schemes in, in most codes. And what this really does is to take the fact that the basis functions are atom-centered. 
to say, okay, I have the charge distribution in terms of the basis functions. The basis functions already have labels corresponding to atoms, so I should be able to sum up all the electrons that are coming from basis functions on an atom and say that's the number of electrons on that atom, and then I can figure out a charge if I subtract out the nuclear charge, right? But, but now you should, you should, you should start you know, jumping up and down and say, well, wait a minute. Okay, first of all, if I start using these bond-centered functions, then I would be in a lot of trouble, right? Because now I have basis functions that I don't know what they belong to. So, okay, so maybe I just stay away from that bond-centered thing. But there's another problem, which is now that my basis set gets larger, gets more and more delocalized as I start in increasing the size of my basis set, then now basis functions start to, it starts to become more and more ambiguous. Basically, imagine that it goes to a constant, right? Then, <laughs> then the basis function belongs to everybody, right? The fact that it's centered here doesn't mean anything anymore. And so that, what that means is that as, the base, as your basis set gets better, the results will not converge. In fact, they'll get, they'll diverge. Right, or they'll start. They'll actually start oscillating as the basis set gets better, and that's something that was shown really a long time ago. Um, okay, so let me say something about. All right, well, I guess I'll, I'll finish this charge theme business. I'll say a few words about covalent linking. So the um, atoms and molecules is another way to do things, and this is actually a density-centered way, which is really pretty attractive, I guess. They define, the atoms now are defined by what they call critical points of the density. It's uh, Bader in, in uh, Canada that is the prime proponent of this. And what's important here is that the definition of the atoms is tied into the charge density. And what that means, that, by the way, critical points, what they really mean by critical points are just inflection points. So I've shown here, this is one of the critical points, is this point where the curvature changes. And then there's a, actually a critical point at infinity and another critical point at infinity here. They're like the inflection points of points of change of sign in the second derivative. But, the, um, but because it's the density that actually defines the atom, the density is well known to actually not empirically to not be that sensitive to basis sets and to your level of description. And so it turns out that the, um, you know, even if you use a very large diffuse basis set, you'll still get the same result for the density. Right? It's, just like, it's just like using the wave function instead of the basis set is really what we're saying. And so it ends up being much more stable. And this is implemented in Gaussians. So it's pretty easy to do. What's not clear is whether stable means correct. Right? So the, there's still the question of what do you want when you're asking for an atomic charge, right? Because if atoms aren't defined in some way that is um, clearly unambiguous, then I should be a little worried. So the other thing I can think about is, and this is really probably what, well, there are problems with this too, but this is electrostatic potential fitting. So the idea here is to find the charge distribution where the charges are constrained to be centered on the atoms that reproduces the electrostatic potential that's produced by the molecule. Now, why is that the right thing to do? Or why am I trying to lead you to think that's the right thing to do? Well, because in a force field, what are you trying to do? You're trying to reproduce the electrostatic potential that's generated by the molecule. So it seems like this is actually, regardless of whether atomic charges are well-defined, this is actually what your real question was. There was a problem with this, and that is that there are oftentimes are many solutions to these equations, especially when the molecule has an interior, and that's what I'm showing you. This happens to be a bunch of methanols around a fluoride or chloride. And the point is that this guy's buried. And since this, ad, since this ion in here, which actually is an anion in this particular case, since it's buried inside the molecule, the electrostatic potential couldn't care less what its charge was, because I could make its charge minus one, and then the hydrogen that's connected to it be you know, zero, or I could make its charge plus one and make the hydrogens all around it sum to minus one, and it wouldn't affect the electrostatic potential not one bit. So that's bad because that means that essentially the charge of that ion is undetermined and what's more I could get really wacky solutions that when the geometry changes and it, it wouldn't matter if the geometry stayed closed all the time but when the geometry changes and it opens up then all of a sudden everything is going to go haywire because now I have this fluoride ion with a plus one charge and these hydrogens with minus 0.3 running around exposed to the solvent or to some part of the protein. So the solution that people came up with um, for this was, for, was restricted ESP fitting. Basically, they said, okay, look, you get unphysical solutions from this, so let's actually put it, let's impose constraints. And the problem is that then, that then basically you have to figure out what are the reasonable values of the charge, and you're sort of back in your, you know, it's not so clear that, that that's, um, it can work, but it requires then some more care. So I. Okay, I better, say, I better say something about covalent embedding. 
And this is really finally the most difficult thing to do, and that is cutting across covalent bonds. And it's almost always required in biological context, which is bad because it's actually also the thing that is, um, that is most, not only most difficult, but most theoretically difficult. There are many strategies around, and it's still not clear which is best or whether any of them work. And work is in quotes here because it's not even really clear what it means to ask whether they work. I mean, you have to, you have to decide what that means. I, <laughs> I don't know, right? We could, we could start saying something, but actually no one's done any real, there's, there's one set of tests that, um, that seems to suggest they're all the same. I'll talk about that later. But it's, there are reasons to believe that that's an artifact um, of the particular tests that were done. So anyway, the, this goes back really to Singh and Coleman who did the, the first link, at, the first solution, the most naive solution really goes back to Singh and Coleman, which was this link atom idea. And that is if I'm gonna cut this bond, so I want this green to be the MM and the red to be the QM, then what I'm gonna need to do is actually have an MM atom here sitting with no valence and that's not really such a big deal because the MM, who cares, right? It, it doesn't have to be connected to anything. Whereas if the QM part's not connected to anything, then there's a, that's a free radical, right? And that's bad. So, the, uh, so we saturate that with the hydrogen, and then, and then look, this is actually pretty bizarre. This was supposed to be the carbon, that carbon connected to that carbon, now there's just this atom just flopping around. Yeah. So I should stop now. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, I don't know. I don't, well, I don't. Maybe it's hard for you to stop. I don't know your data. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Klaus. Okay, I'm actually, well, I wanted actually to say something about covalent embedding. I can say actually two more things and then I'll stop. No, no, I'm, the, I'm just against it. Because <laughs> you don't have to talk. You have also asked about the sort of test. Yeah. And that should be a five more minutes. And then okay. And you have to stop to take this. <laughs> Okay. Yeah. Sure. Fine. Okay. So the um, all right. So basically, the problems with this link atom idea. I mean, you can see besides it being aesthetically pretty unpleasing, you have extra degrees of freedom that you've introduced. So somehow you have to remove these. The link atom somehow needs to be connected to the MM part of the simulation, and otherwise there'll be problems. The electronic structure at the boundary could be very different if hydrogen and the atom it replaces don't have similar electronegativities. This is actually a very important point. The hydrogen is not the same as fluorine, and it's not the same even as carbon. And so hydrogen is a, le the, that is a hydrogen, a hydrogen with one is not the same as a carbon with all of its valences filled except one even, right? That's not even true. They have different electronegativities, which means they have different charge withdrawing characteristics, which means actually that you're going to, that you have the possibility of charging the QM system by doing this. And that could cause lots of trouble. And so people have thought of ways to deal with this. You can read them on your own, the last one. And instead, I'll just go to the frozen orbital ideas because this is really the right, I think that this is the right sort of idea. And that is basically to somehow have a wave function here, which is a free radical but which actually is constrained to point in one direction and where there's effectively on the other side with this MM atom also has a ghost electron, right? So that it makes the bond. But that, so the idea is to have a schizophrenic atom. So in the link atom case, you had an extra atom, but what you could have is an atom that actually was both molecular mechanical and quantum mechanical. And then you could parameterize that such that the, um, that is fix the orbital on that atom such that it had to point in one direction and that that was connected to the, where, the, where the molecular mechanics bonds were. <coughs> it's still not perfect, but, the, um, but you can then actually start to get pretty close to something that doesn't introduce extra degrees of freedom, doesn't introduce too much charge disparity or charge transfer disparity, electronegativity disparity. And that's the, um, and this is really the summary of the approaches. Basically, Karplus and, and co-workers have really these link atoms. They've, as I, I mentioned, they actually published a paper where they showed that for a particular set of tests, the, it didn't really matter whether you use link atoms or frozen orbitals. But the, the thing to remember or to point out about that is that it was with semi-empirical quantum mechanical embedding, right? So the quantum mechanical part was semi-empirical. And semi-empirical doesn't actually have very much flexibility to get these problems with charge transfer and with leakage of electrons and all of this kind of thing that actually is really the main concern. So it's not clear whether that test 
really tells you that you shouldn't worry about this or not. It's, it's the jury's still out. Uh, Friesner and coworkers have used sort of a hybrid orbital that's like a frozen orbital, and Gao and coworkers have also used sort of a hybrid orbital type of method with a semi-empirical interior. And actually, um, Yang, the, this is really a link atom with a, with a modified electronegativity. But, but you see that basically these are the three approaches running around are link atoms, modified link atoms, and frozen orbitals. And you have to choose between them, and it's unclear which one is really right. So, so I guess with that, I'll, I'll stop so that, so that you guys can have a few minutes to ask, ask questions so that <laughs> if you want. And, the, um, and thank you for your attention. We have, other people have, I and mean, we've done it actually with quantum dynamics. So we've done quantum dynamics around quantum, quantum mechanics and molecular mechanics. Actually I, didn't, actually, I didn't really, I didn't emphasize that, but it's, really, but it's a pet peeve, so I think I will, which is that people call QMMM, QMMM means one thing, and that one thing is actually what I talked about. Right? QMMM does not mean having quantum weight, quantum dynamics in the nuclei, or any quantum effects in the nuclei it does not mean that, <laughs> and so, but there, are, but there seems to be, there's a number of people that think that it does, and so, whatever it does, it, it never used to mean that, and I don't think it should mean that. But the, but, but yeah, you can do it. You can do molecular dynamics, either classical or quantum mechanical, wrapped around QMMM, and it's just harder, right? It's harder than than doing it around a force field. And that's, and you have to then you have to be very careful when you do that, that you are um, essentially that you have properly, that you've coded things. So anyway, there are QMMM um, things in, in codes that you can get your hands on. They, some of them will do dynamics. None of them will do anything beyond <laughs> classical dynamics that you can get freely available. The reason for that isn't that people are trying to keep it from you. The reason for that is that it's still at the sort of cutting edge. So. And the, even QMMD is just leaving that stage. Sure, we've actually done it. I did, I, we, I've been, other people have done it before us. So we did it actually for um, excited state properties because we introduced the first QMMM technique that could, um, I think it was, well, okay, one of the first maybe, QMMM techniques that could do um, excite, your excited states and ground states and then go and search, do photochemical types of things. And, and we did that. Um, I can give you the reference to the paper. But other people have done it before in the context of ground state just of, of reaction energetics. And the, what you typically find, I don't know whether this should be very suspicious and raise flags or not, but what you typically find is actually that in the QM region, the QMMM looks like, looks more or less like the QM, and near the boundary, it looks like the average of the QM and the MM, and in the MM region, it looks like the MM, right? And somehow I, well, somehow I think that sounds really fishy, but, <laughs> but that's what it looks like. So I, that's probably the best you could hope for. But that it really does look, it, it, oh, you can almost do that exactly. You can almost take a function that is just a, um, like a spatial localization function around the border and, the, and basically just sum them together and get exactly the, the average them with almost a universal function. It's, it's
Well, an embedded atom method, I mean, that actually would be, yeah, okay. So the question is whether or not you can use different classical force fields. An embedded atom method, that has, that's really a completely different game because that, and it could be actually a really smart thing to do because the embedded atom method now is something that has very clear ties back to density functional theory so that you might actually be able to get around some of the problems that we're talking about. But, um, but in terms of other force fields just being amber versus charm, there are issues. You get different answers because you get the average of the two. Again, it's basically the same thing. You get the average of the boundary of, these, of QM, which is the same, and the MM. And the real problem is that the MM is not polarizable in any of these, pro in any of these things, but the QM is. And so that's, that leads to actually some serious imbalances compared to the MM only. And it may be, what I don't, what I don't think anybody's really done is ask the question whether the MM, all MM was better than QMMM. And the reason is because they only, you, only, you would only do QMMM if you're doing the QM for something that you can't do with MM. But, but that test probably should be done because I, it's very possible that the QMMM is worse <laughs> things that, than, the, than MM alone because of the fact that it has an imbalanced treatment of the polarizability. That will go away as polarizable force fields come in and as people start to figure out, you know, one of the things that you know, a number of people now are thinking very hard about, which is how do you actually move charge across these QMM boundaries? So if you're going to have the boundaries, how do you actually start moving electrons around? And if you could do that, then a lot of the problems or a lot of these issues of imbalanced treatments of polarizability would go away. Yes. Well, it's, yeah, the, the question is where, do you, where does the QMM Hamiltonian come into play? And the answer to that is actually that, the, um, that every term in the QMM Hamiltonian has, is either has a QM atom label and an MM atom label, in which case it's global. It may not actually, the van der Waals, for example, only actually makes a difference in that boundary region, but it actually is operative everywhere. Right? It's, just that the, it's just that the van der Waals between two things that are 10 angstroms apart is zero, so it doesn't matter. So you're really summing over the boundary region. But if terms are not of that character, then they're of a character which actually depends on the quantum mechanical density and the molecular mechanical atoms. And those can be really long range forces actually because the integral over them, basically they're Coulomb, right? And it depends on how effectively they're screened. So, um, and they, it's just like full electrostatics versus cutoff electrostatics in MD is where that, what that question really, the answer to that question becomes. Do you have a rough or experimental indication of what the field of polarization is? Actually, we run a bunch of actual physics to your colleagues because it could be asked in all of your Well, OK. Yeah, there are, yeah, there actually are, yeah, there are. We can do, I mean, what, it depends on what you want to see. There haven't, there haven't, first of all, there haven't really been, it's not that there are 10 million QMM simulations out there. There are, they're still relatively few in number. The probably the most famous one actually is one that I think I referenced, which is this uh, tri, triose phosphate isomerase or whatever um, that Karplus and Cui did, where they basically did all of the uh, transition states and reaction paths. We've done, I mean, if you want to look at photochemistry, we've done it in solution. We've done it in protein as well, but I don't have the results to show you yet. But, the, um, but basically, yeah, I don't know, it depends on what you want to see. So if you want to see the, most of the work on the ground state, which actually isn't usually my interest, but most of the work on ground electronic states is, um, would be out of either Friesner's group, of, of which there's actually one, this uh, methane, uh, methane monoxygenase. There's um, in Murakuma's group, it actually came out just last week. There's a paper on um, ribonuclease reductase, and they, where basically all that they show is the structure. So they do the structure, they basically take the X-ray structure, they compare it to a free cluster that they do with DFT, and the agreement's not so great, and then they do it with QMMM, and the agreement is, lo and behold, much better, <laughs> or whatever that, you know, whatever that means. They, uh, the RMSDs go down, right? But I'm not sure yet what that really means. And then the, um, and then there are, and then, then there are, what, uh, there are several papers of those in the Carplus group. 
And then and Bash actually has a number of papers where he did reaction paths. So I mean, I think that, again, I, one of the things I've been trying to say is that this is not well benchmarked stuff, right? So this is not, this is actually, it hasn't, it's not the case that people have actually been able to, t are able to tell you, I can't tell you, nobody can tell you that where it's gonna work and where it's gonna fail and because it's still, it's still too new. So it's, yeah. Well, he asked the question already, so I guess. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> no, you can't. You asked the question already. You can't continue your question. <laughs> no, I was going to like this. You asked the question. You could ask me afterwards. What was the. That's actually what I was. When I talked about Morikuma's calculation, that's what I mean. It actually is a. It's an onion idea. But it's not any different in terms of boundary issues from QMM. I mean, I tried to I tried to emphasize that already with onium, which actually is really the better place to emphasize that. Where in onium things it's much clearer what you're doing, and it's also much clearer why things are going to fail. And then when you start thinking about onium with an MD layer, an MM, or an MM layer, excuse me, on the outside of a QM layer, the differences are even larger between the model and the real system. And so, you know, if if onium is going to work best, it's going to work best in the QM QM model. Which doesn't mean it doesn't work. It's just that the again, where is it going to work best? That's where it's going to work best. And so, so um, I think it's very promising. I think that's actually a really good way to do it. But I don't think it's intrinsically better than the than the idea of writing down a QMM Hamiltonian directly instead of doing it by energy differences. It's the same. Those same terms have to be small for either of them to work. I have to remind 